My name is Ken Yeo. I am uh, now a novice Zen Buddhist priest. I'm a resident at Great Vow Zen Monastery. I've been here four and a half years. And that's my current life. I've had many lives before this. Some, somehow, cosmic forces put me in that position. And a bunch of bald people took me into a room and shaved my head. And there was no going back after that. There was a lot of preparation. None of it was um, really the work of my will. What was needed in order to prepare me for it appeared. And it didn't match my image of myself or of my life. All the old conditioning was against it. <laughs> and. Uh, there were many times when I felt that it, I, that it, there was no way I could continue or that it seemed to be in conflict with, with everything that I recognized as, as myself and my, uh, my image of myself. And yet somehow there was something deeper that allowed me to continue. And, and there was a deep knowing of that within me. It was not just a matter of being at the whim of alien forces, but uh, after my first Sashin at Zen Mountain Monastery, uh, I, I really thought that I could think my way out of uh, the truth. I was encountering the call to surrender. There was a, a clear uh, change in my orientation. There was a sense that, oh, the compass had been set and that these other concerns, they just, they were falling away. And I was learning to trust in that, that direction that was set by the cosmos. You know, it's, it's a level of life that is really so basic and so natural. The, the whole ceremony, having everyone there uh, at the ordination, my family, all the residents here, all the people in the wider Sangha had the feeling of a, uh, an auspicious cosmic event, kind of like the assembly that's gathered at the beginning of the Mahayana Sutras. You see all of these bodhisattvas were there and all these great lay practitioners and uh, all the respected elders and five generations of people from this town and this village. And, and what was I? I was like the newborn baby. There's a way in which our world is losing touch with the most basic essential reality of human existence. And the, the wisdom traditions preserve knowledge of that reality and the modern world is cutting itself off from those traditions, losing confidence in those traditions. The, the crises that we face on the planet, the 
ecological crisis, uh, uh, war and, and famine and uh, gl global conflict, terrorism, none of that can be separated from that losing touch with the, the essential truth of being human. I think that's really the, at the heart of, of all of these crises. And so there's a way in which reconnecting with those traditions, which is reconnecting with the basic nature of our existence. And that's what religion is. That's what it means, religion, relinking, linking us back to the source of everything. Uh, reconnecting with with religion in that way is something that's urgently needed. It's maybe essential to our survival as a species and certainly necessary for living in a health, healthy, balanced way on the planet. In a way, part of the role of a priest, I think, is one of grieving and, and reminding us to, to, that we are in grief, that we are, that we are mourning the, mourning, mourning the, the extinctions of species uh, on the planet, but also just mourning death as a reality. We, we heard from Harada Roshi this morning the advice that he would give to a beginning Zen student, just don't think. <laughs> and of course, that's, that's not easy to do. But you know, that doesn't mean just be stupid. It means that surrender to this reality that is beyond your thoughts. And he offered that as advice to a beginner, but I'm a beginner. If I could do that, if I could actually just go beyond any judgment I might have about whether things are going well or whether I'm doing the practice right or getting good results or bad results, that, that's why Zen is important. That's, that's, that's the power it has, that it, it's very clear about that. While I'm certainly not free of obsessing about whether I'm succeeding or failing, I have some sense that I am I'm following a, a path that really is not governed by my, my evaluations of my own life. And I, I'm f finding myself more able to enjoy myself <laughs> and, and to appreciate a person who was not the person I thought was there and is not uh, easily defined and, and um, is, is not the person I had imagined. And so I'm in a way finding, I'm in a way getting to know this new person who really doesn't have a very clear shape um, I mean, I have a bald head now, <laughs> and that's, that's interesting, but uh, there's, there's a lot of potential in, in what, uh, what I'm finding in myself now. And that there's a lot of space and a lot of, a lot of unknown. And it, 
the less the less I can try to 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 get a grip on it or pin it down, the the, the better things will go for everyone. Now the universe rejoices, the earth trembles and the flowers fall. The bodhisattvas of other worlds ask their Buddha what this means, and the Buddha replies that a new disciple has been given the pure great precepts of the bodhisattvas and has taken the fourfold vow to liberate all beings. He has been converted to the truth by the master who received it before in the teaching of Shakyamuni, who is the Buddha of this world. This new priest will become a Buddha in the future through this merit. Therefore, the universe rejoices. The bodhisattvas, upon hearing this explanation, bow, saying, if this is so, they have the same mind and heart as we do.